Hi! In the last four videos I've been covering what are graph databases and their differentiating features from relational databases. These videos have been primarily focusing on systems that adopt the property graph data model because that's the model that's adopted by Kuzu, but we also cover the second class of systems called RDF systems. Now although these are two separate class of database management systems, in current jargon both are referred to with the term quote unquote graph databases because records in both property graphs and RDF logically form a graph that contrasts with the tabular data model of relational systems. In the next two videos, I want to broaden the term graph database even more and use it to refer to several other classes of systems that also adopt some form of graph-based model and tell you about their history. So, if this is a bird-eyes view of several important classes of systems that have been built in history, in fact, Six classes of database management systems can be considered as having an underlying graph-based model all the way from the very first database ever built in history called the IDS system, which was based on a model called the network model, to document-oriented database management systems such as the popular MongoDB system, which adopts tree-based models. I have three goals in these videos. First, the history of database management systems is fascinating and I hope to share some inspiring and amusing historical anecdotes that may raise your interest in this history. Second, I want to connect several features that we see in modern graph database management systems back to their historic roots in other systems. And third, by showing you many classes of systems that are based on graph-based models, I hope to convince you that it's not a coincidence that many database management systems are being built on graph-based models. After all, graphs, along with tables, are very natural data structures to logically model records in data intensive applications. And in the sense that I'm using the term graph database in these videos, graph databases have always existed and will always exist. So with that, let's get started with the first part where I will take you to the birth of the field of databases and tell you about two of the earliest systems ever built in history called the IDS and IMS systems. I want to start with a history that's very dear to my heart and tell you about the very first database management system in history called the Integrated Data Store or the IDS system and pay tribute to someone who has deeply affected the field of databases, the amazing Charlie Bachman. IDS was built between 1960 and 1964 at General Electric, back when there was no software industry, let alone a database industry. The development was led by Charlie Bachman, who was an engineer and a manager at General Electric, and Bachman is credited as the inventor of database management systems for his role in the IDS project. IDS was motivated by a suite of applications, but the most important one was to handle the records needed to manage large engineering and manufacturing projects of the time. We will discuss one such application in detail later on, but for now, let me just discuss the data model of the system, which was called the network model. And network, as many of you will know, is really a synonym for graph. In 2009, Bachmann wrote an article on the history of the IDS system, in which he says that one requirement of IDS's data model was that it needed to model dependencies between different tasks in large engineering projects. Recall from my previous videos that one of the benefits of graph modeling is that graphs or networks are natural abstractions to model dependency relationships between entities such as X depending on Y and Y depending on Z, etc. Here is the specific quote from Bachmann's article. In 1960, industry experience with large engineering and construction projects indicated the need to explicitly recognize the network structure of the interconnected steps within large projects and to deal with the precedence of some steps as related to others. Here is what the actual model of IDS looked like. First, there were records, which you can think of as your nodes, records that clear schemas, so their fields were predefined. Second, there were links, which were one-to-many relationships between records. This one-to-many limitation apparently existed to simplify implementing the model in the IDS system. The more common term used for links in the IDS system were owner member sets or chains. Let's take our financial transactions network example of accounts and the e-transfers between accounts and model it equivalently in IDS's network model. You would have account records with owner and country fields similar to the account nodes in the property graph model. The convention was to draw these as rectangles and not as circles back in the day. And 
To model the many-to-many e-transfer relationships between accounts, you would use two separate one-to-many relationships as follows. First, you would model each e-transfer between two accounts as an e-transfer record, so think of these as e-transfer nodes and not relationships. So we would have four e-transfer records because we have four e-transfers in our example. Then you would have a one-to-many links called e-transfer from that would link each e-transfer record to the account record that has sent this e-transfer. And a second one-to-many links called e-transfer to that would now link each e-transfer record to the receiver account record. Now, I'm actually cheating a little bit in my visual drawing of how records would be linked with each other. In reality, each account record would not have separate links to each e-transfer record that it sent or received. For example, I'm showing here that Alice's account has separate links to two e-transfer records that were sent from Alice's account. Instead, those two e-transfer records would be linked with each other and Alice's account to form a chain that was called an owner member set. So, if you accessed Alice's account record as an IDS programmer, you could follow these chains to loop through each e-transfer record that was sent out of Alice's account, similar to looping through each outgoing e-transfer edge of Alice's account node in modern property graph databases. Now that I've explained owner member sets, let me show you one of my favorite pictures from an IDS advertisement campaign. This is a 1962 drawing of IDS's network model, and its footnote says that using getNext calls, an IDS programmer could traverse these chains of records, similar to how in many modern APIs we use getNext calls to traverse edges of nodes. IDS has a long legacy that is still visible in today's database technology, for example, the idea of having a logical model of your records that is independent from their physical storage was invented in IDS, even if it did not offer perfect independence. Key-based record access, that is the idea of having primary keys to retrieve your records, was invented in IDS. Data definition, manipulation, and retrieval commands that form the database query language that could be embedded in a programming language called COBOL was invented in IDS, even if the entire programming experience was procedural and not declarative as in modern query languages that are based on SQL. In addition, the first efforts to standardize any database technology was to standardize the network data model and COBOL, which was published in 1971, 15 years before the first SQL standard came out. And finally, and this may surprise you the most, IDS is still sold and used today. According to Bachmann's 2009 article, in 2009, there were over 1,000 installations of IDS, or IDMS as its later versions were called, with the largest installation being the British Telecom, processing over 295 million transactions per day and 12 terabytes of total records. Here is a timeline of the main events in the commercialization of IDS. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but since 1960s, the system has been renamed to IBMS and rewritten for IBM mainframe computers. And today, the system is sold and developed by a company called Broadcom, whose 2024 brochure I'm showing here. I want to end this part about IDS with some fun facts about Charlie Bachman. As many of you will know, the highest honor given to computer scientists is the ACM Turing Award, named after Alan Turing, similar to the Fields Award in Mathematics or the Nobel Prize in Sciences. Bachmann was given the Turing Award for his contributions to database management systems in 1973 and he is the first person to be given the award for contributions to databases. The other three being, by the way, Ted Cott for inventing the relational model, Jim Gray for his contributions to transaction processing, and Mike Stonebreaker for broadly popularizing databases and making them practical through his many systems and his entrepreneurship. And I'm not including Jeff Allman, with whom I had the privilege of working very closely during my own PhD, who is also a core database researcher and was given the award, but not for his contributions to databases, but instead to algorithms and programming languages. Coming back to Bachmann, interestingly, Bachmann is one of the few Turing Award winners who was an engineer and not a researcher. For example, he did not hold a PhD. And quite amusingly, as he explains on one of his talks, which you can find on YouTube, he apparently did not know who Turing was when he was given the award. And as he explains, after understanding the importance of the award, he does some research on Turing and even pays tribute to Alan Turing by finding and visiting Alan Turing's mother, Sarah Turing, in England. 
And here's a picture of them from 1974, from Bachmann's visit to Sarah Turing. Finally, if you're interested in the history of IDS and the birth of data management, I highly recommend this article on the birth of the field by Thomas Hay, who is a computer science historian. You will find many more details about this history and the major events that took place in the 1960s as this new fundamental class of technology was coming about. The second database data model that I want to cover is the hierarchical data model. The hierarchical data model is very similar to the network model and is essentially a restriction of the network model where instead of forming arbitrary graphs of records, you can only form trees of records. And trees are the natural abstraction to represent strict hierarchies in the real world. The classic example motivating the hierarchical data model was the bill of materials application where the goal is to model the complex structures of large engineering and manufacturing projects. Recall that this was also one of the motivating applications of the IDS system. In bill of materials, one represents a large manufacturing structure by breaking it down into a hierarchy of subcomponents recursively. For example, a bike consists of a handlebar, a frame assembly and a seat, and the frame assembly further consists of two wheels and the frame and the wheel further consists of some spokes and tire rims, so on and so forth. The most important system that adopts the hierarchical data model is the IBM Information Management System or IMS. The birth of IMS is directly connected to NASA's Apollo space program, which was the American mission to send a human to the moon back in 1960s. A spacecraft being one of the largest manufacturer's vehicles in the world naturally has a highly sophisticated assembly. In 1965, a company named Rockwell wins the bid to manufacture the actual spacecraft that would be used in the mission. And being a manufacturing and not a software company, Rockwell partners with IBM to build an information system to manage the structure and dependencies of the assembly, which leads to the IBM IMS system. The system becomes operational in 1968 and is then more broadly commercialized as a standalone product of IBM. As such, IMS is considered the first commercial database management system in history. And similar to IDS, it is surprisingly still a very actively developed and deployed system. According to a 2009 article on the history of IMS, IMS is still a very important source of revenue for IBM with over $1 billion in estimated revenue in 2009. Now, I've said that both network and hierarchical databases adopt the graph-based model. Nonetheless, graph or network-based modeling in the context of these systems was not really about the advantages of graph-based modeling that we highlight today. For example, today we highlight the advantages of entity and relationship-oriented modeling that graphs provide or how using graphs as a model makes finding patterns or deep or recursive connections between your entities very natural. Instead, Graph-based modeling in these early systems was about pre-joining your records with each other through explicit links so database programmers could navigate this graph of records and find their records quickly. So for example, you could fetch a record about Alice's account and from that access a related record, say the e-transfers that Alice sent and from those access other related records, say the other receiving accounts, so on and so forth. Bachmann called this style of programming navigational database programming which was a major invention at the time. In fact, he titled this Turing Award Lecture, Programmer as a Navigator. The history that I wanted to cover is that when Ted Codd was popularizing his relational model in 1970s, he in fact criticized this property of Bachmann's graph database and hierarchical databases very frequently. He called this pre-joining of records as predefining your joins and made the following criticism. Code argued that in the relational model, you could join any two records in any two tables, say T1 and T2, on any two columns, as long as those two columns have the same data type. In contrast, he said in the network model, you have to predefine a priori the records that you want to join with each other by forming explicit links between them as you insert these records into the system. Therefore, Code argued, the relational model is more flexible than the network model because it allows you to join your records ad hoc. In other words, Ted Code argued that in the relational model, joins are value-based, while in the network model, they are pointer-based or based on explicit physical links. Now, interestingly, in modern graph databases, users still effectively pre-join node records with each other. 
For example, when a user tells a property graph database that here is an e-transfer relationship between Alice's account and Bob's account, this is effectively telling the system that these two account records are explicitly linked. So we can say that despite Ted Cott's criticism, the feature of pre-joining records has survived the test of time and found its way into modern graph databases. However, it's no longer a restriction as Ted Cott criticized back in the day, it's in fact an important optimization. It's not a restriction because modern graph databases, just like relational databases, can now join arbitrary records with each other. For example, suppose you had a database of persons and country nodes and each country had a code property and suppose that each person had a country code property indicating the code of the country that they live in. Now, to join the person nodes with the country nodes that they live in, you can write the following cipher query. Notice that in the match clause, there is no explicit relationship pattern drawn between the P person and C country node records. Instead, this query expresses vanilla value-based joins between P person and C country node records based on the equality of the country code and code properties of these records, just like the join you would do in SQL if you had person and country tables. However, you can also explicitly define a lives-in relationship between person and country node and pre-join each person node P with the country node C that they live in by inserting a new lives-in relationship record into the database between P and C. If you do that, you can now ask the same query in Cypher by explicitly drawing a lives-in relationship pattern in your match clause between your P person and C country nodes and further the second query will be faster. The reason is that when you insert relationship records into a system and effectively predefine your joins, systems can do several optimizations that they cannot do with value-based joins. For example, systems can build join or quote-unquote adjacency list indices that store for each node U the record IDs of other nodes that U is connected with then, during query processing, given node U, systems can in constant time access all other nodes that U is connected with. Further, all joins over relationships happen using integer record IDs, which are faster than joins over, say, strings, which might be used in value-based joins. So I hope you found the history that I covered so far interesting, and you can see some deep connections between modern graph as well as relational databases and some of the oldest databases in history. In the next video, I'll cover several other classes of systems that are also based on graph-based models, coming all the way to modern property graph and RDF databases. If you enjoy the history of databases, let me share another historical anecdote that is not about graph databases, but I think I can squeeze it here because we talked about Ted Cott. A decade after the invention of the network model by Bachmann, Ted Cott came up with his major invention, the relational model, in 1970 at IBM. And soon after, IBM started its historic System R project, which was the first prototype relational database management system built in history. But for reasons that are not clear to me, and do let me know if you know the answers, Ted Codd was not part of the System R team. Instead, he led a separate but very ambitious project called Rendezvous, whose goal will sound very familiar in our LLM-dominated world namely the goal of developing a natural language interface over databases. And if you're impressed with the fact that LLMs can take natural language questions and answer them by retrieving records from databases, do take a look at Ted Codd's 1978 technical report on Rendezvous to see what they were able to achieve back when there were no LLMs, no advanced machine learning, no out-of-the-box natural language parsers, or even a mature database industry. With that, See you in the next video and please subscribe to our channel.